Tommy K reacts to the 100 biggest battles of the human history. The 100 biggest battles. I read this book as a kid because I didn't have real friends. So <laughs> <laughs> we look at the Battle of Kadesh, the legendary battle of Marathon. Today, ladies and gentlemen, already in episode three, maybe my personally favorite battle of all times. Today, we react to the battle. It is the battle that is so discussed, so scandalous. People don't know what really happened. Is it romanticized? Is the movie against Persians? What the fuck? It is the battle of Thermopylae. This battle has interested me so much as a kid. This battle has done so much for me. I really cared about it. I researched it a lot. There is a chance that if that battle did not happen historically, the movie 300 was never made and I would have never become an alpha. Luckily, I did become an alpha. Let's react, ladies and gentlemen, to the bravest men that ever walked this earth. I can't see shit on me glasses. Already I would suck in the Greek uh, in the... If my grandpa could see me, he would be so proud right now of this stream. Fucking <laughs> 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 retarded Spartan! That battle had so much, especially the movie 300, had so much influence on me as a kid, man. I, I really started working out and wanted, I wanted to be one of them. 15 minutes? Oh, that's a lot of views. Let's try this one. What's but tell me, check my link, shut the fuck up. Gentlemen, the battle that made us men. Democracy traces its roots to ancient Greece, a land of squabbling city-states. Amongst these warring city-states arose a Athens, a group of men who had a funny idea. Citizens should get a say in who exactly got to rule them. Though initially imperfect in its implementation, that idea has since evolved to the free democratic Tomopoli? nations most of us Tomopoli. live in today. But it could all have been lost Tomopoli. to a single moment in history. Hello and welcome to another Surprise, episode of the Show. Today, There's we're a taking a look at you, another of the great battles in history, the Battle of Thermopylae. In four uh, I remember, man, I was, very, uh, I was really a big fan of that fight and... Um, I was such a fan of the battle that I actually planned I wanted to go to Sparta so I could kneel in front of the statue. I was like 18 years old, man. I was a fucking weird kid like you guys. And one thing I actually did is I went to the Louvre in Paris because there's a very, very famous picture of the Battle of Thermopylae. This is a picture. I don't know exactly what the history is behind that. Uh, made in the Renaissance or something. Uh, and this shows uh, King Leonidas at the Battle of Thermopylae. Uh, and I went to the Louvre just to, to see that, man. 499 BC, Greek cities which had been captured by the Persians and Asia Minor revolted against the brutal tyrants that had been placed to oversee them. In support of their conquered brethren, Athens and Eritrea sent troops. Well, Despite some I major say? gains, several strategic Timber mistakes Pilots. cost the Greeks of Asia Tell Minor their ultimate victory, and the rebellion was put down. With Asia Minor back in the fold of the Persian Empire, the Persian king Darius I vowed to punish Athens and Eritrea for their involvement and saw the rest of the free cities of Greece as a threat to his empire. In 492 BC, he launched an invasion of Thrace and Macedon, then sent the heralds to the remaining Greek city-states, demanding they accept Persian rule. Seeking to save themselves, many agreed, with the notable exceptions of Athens and Sparta. The Persian heralds in Athens were thrown into a pit, and their Spartan brethren followed suit by tossing theirs into a well, enraged. So, if that actually is historic, that the tossing in the well scene kind of has a historic background a little bit, right? That they actually toss people in wells? Darius launched his invasion of mainland Greece and met with further success until an encounter against 10,000 Athenians in Marathon. Outnumbering the Greeks two and a half to one, Darius saw an easy win only for- Yeah, and you're telling me that then in Tamu Papaluli that 250,000 Persians came? I, 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 I'm not an historian, but in, in this time, an army of 250k just seems... But here, this is a historical book, and the historians say 250k. I don't For the Athenians know, to achieve a dramatic victory More and like forced children, Darius yeah. to retreat. Nursing a very wounded ego, Darius planned an imminent reinvasion with plans to raise Athens to the ground. But internal politics delayed these plans, and Darius died of old age. Seeking to avenge the pride of his dead came, father, Thank you, Xerxes Logan, prepared for a decisive campaign to end Greek independence forever. Remembering well the lessons at Marathon, Xerxes Persia took his giant at this time. But how do you move 250k? How do you fucking give them? 
enough water and food. That's what? Man? And to build a sizable fort. That seems impossible. Though some historical accounts tell of a force of up to two and a half million. Ah, come on! Some historical accounts. What, your mom's fucking Twitter account? What the fuck is this bullshit? Being strong. That's These are almost crap, certainly man. gross exaggerations. And it's more likely that Xerxes marched with 200,000 to. But even he says up to 200k, man. That's. That's a cr that's that's 20 times the Helm's Deep army, bro. 250,000. Dude. Though for the ancient world, this would certainly have been an incredible and mind-boggling number. Yes. Xerxes' plan was simple. March into Greece through the north and outflank any Greek defenders by landing his navy behind them along the Greek coast. Many <coughs> Greeks feared Xerxes' invasion them. force and remembered well the fate of Eritrea in the first invasion, which was razed to the ground and all of its people this enslaved. Want to play Thus, many <laughs> Greek cities bid for peace, but Athens and Sparta along with some key allies, would hear nothing of it. Spartan King Leonidas marshaled a force of 300 of his personal bodyguards and helots and took command of the briefly unified 7, 000, Greek yeah. forces numbering at 7,000. I always know a bit more here than this uh, YouTuber. The reason that it was only 300 is that during the time of this battle, there was a certain uh, festival in Sparta called the Kanaya, where you uh, are not allowed to anger the gods. You cannot go to war during that time. So Leonidas uh, was like, that probably really happened. It looks historically like this happened, which is why King Leonidas was the greatest alpha chat ever he said oh man i still want to fight so these 300 they're just my bodyguards they're just my bodyguards man and that's why the number of the 300 came along man despite the way the battle was popularized by popular culture and entertainment movie, such as the film 300 the bulk of the spartan army did not march in support of its king because the spartans greatly feared that the helots they held as slaves might break into an all-out revolt if the yeah, army you know, left it's and didn't they take them with them slaves. knowing victory would be impossible Every if the persian other forces stuff, simply man. outflanked them by sea Athens marshaled a force of 271 triremes to sail into battle against 1,207 Persian ships. Yeah, 1,200 ships? 500 before Christ? Uh, what the fuck, man? Both on land Jeez. and at sea, the Greeks stood little chance of victory. A collapse of the Spartan position at Thermopylae would allow the fleet to <clears> be flanked, and a defeat at sea would place the ground defense in jeopardy. Outnumbered by incredible ratios, the victory huge was concern. unlikely. A fact Athens knew well, as it had already begun the evacuation of the city. The combatants. The Persian army at the time was equipped for battle on the plains of Asia, and as such, wore mostly leather and cloth armor and shields made of wicker. After this, they I want to see short if we have a more and large daggers and swords. Stuff. Most notably, the Persians, likely accustomed to fighting less well armored opponents than the Greeks, made extensive use of archers, which was part of the reason of their defeat at Marathon. The lightly armored Persian archers could not penetrate the armor of the Athenian forces, and when close to melee range were made short work of. Leading the Persian troops was a force of 10,000 immortals, a cadre of elite soldiers famed for always maintaining a standing force of exactly 10,000. Hence the name fucking Immortals. Epic is dead, man. That fucking existed in our real world. There was a dude who was like, yeah, we're the immortals, there's only 10,000, not more, not less. And we're fucking elite. When any member was but killed, these wounded, really... or became sick, they were immediately replaced. There's actually like a historical, um, they didn't look, they, that, yeah, this, this picture here, this picture, I remember this one. This is apparently how uh, an immortal would have looked back then, right? And that's very good armor for back then. That is like historical uh, and not this fucking bullshit, man. Thus, leaving the Immortals a cohesive unit through any conflict. The Immortals were Persia's elite heavy infantry and often served as guards to the Thank god you, kings themselves. Up, you, At man. sea, the Persians fielded the warship of the day, the Trireme. Powered by a combination of sails and oars, triremes were equipped with a bronze sheathed battering ram, which it used to ram enemy vessels. However, it's unlikely that these violent crashes would actually sink an enemy ship. I remember, and most of the fighting was done in hand to hand combat by the Marines and slaves who manned the ships. Formidable for their time, triremes were also notoriously poor seagoing vessels and had to stay close to shore and operate only during relatively calm seas. A series of storms prior to the battle would see nearly a third of the Persian fleet sunk, severely lowering their naval power. To complicate matters, a great deal of the Persian fleet was also made of supply and support vessels, not dedicated warships. Yeah, I don't like this Leonidas video, sorry, we're doing a better one. Because this one, sources and scholarly debates, what is that?
two months of subbing time. Elapsed in summer of 480 BC, a large that always looks more nerdy. I like that. Towards Greece. I like that. The ancient historiographer Herodotus dramatizes this by stating that their footsteps tremble and their thirst. Yeah, that looks much better. That looks like what is leaving behind mean. just miserable rivulets. This force approached. Imagine the... Herodotus would have not existed, man. This guy gave so many swords of ancient Greek to our world nowadays, man. What an important guy, dude. Mountain pass of Thermopylae. Very small squad of Greek defenders. Dude, that looks like you guys remember that really creepy TV show? Reminds me the way they move reminds me of this. So creepy this fucking TV show. Halli hallo! Ich lade euch ein zu meiner Show. Like this is like a fever dream, dude. This was uh children TV when I was a kid. Led oh, by the famous Spartan king Leonidas, expected them with sharp spears. What led to this situation? One of the most common narratives in contemporary historiography explains it as follows. As the young Persian Empire expanded towards Europe in the 6th century BC, Greece and Asia Minor were caught in the Persian sphere of influence. At the same time, the Greek city-states had become an influential power in these regions themselves. In 499 BC, Athens supported an uprising of the Ionian Greeks against the Persians in Asia Minor. The Persians were greatly angered by this intervention and launched a punitive attack in 499 BC. Very, very threatening this at that attack point. was so repelled scary. by the Athenians in the famous Battle of Marathon. The young Persian king Darius I was infuriated by this defeat and planned revenge. However, this was delayed by internal problems such as revolutions, so that only his successor Xerxes I picked up his plans to invade Greece. The Greeks got scent of this plan and gathered at Corinth in 481 BC, where they forged an alliance which was led by the Spartans. But it was the Athenian Themistocles the who came these? up with... What the, what the fuck is that? That's the creepiest shit ever! What the hell is that? The defense plan. God the damn it. Move to Kara? No, but I need to do this here, man. Hold the two crucial I locations. Took... At Artemisium, the fleet should hold the sea. And at Thermopylae, the Thank land you, forces should hold the Thank mountain you. pass. The Greeks chose these two locations because they were heavily outnumbered and stood a much better chance against the Persian army when fighting in narrow terrain. Yeah, they knew, they knew the their Persians home, man. couldn't they knew where to their defend. full force at once. In the late summer of 480 BC, the Greeks and Persians moved their forces in place. The battle is about to begin. Despite the popularized view of the battle, portrayed for example by the... It's so funny how 300 is such a massively influential movie that every time you discuss this battle, you gotta have a little side note of that movie, man, because it was movie just so influential. We don't know all that much about the battle, because there really aren't many sources about this event at all. In fact, there are only three main sources, and they present a bunch of problems. Firstly, there is some archaeological evidence, such as the base of a statue containing a short inscription, a funerary epitaph, and a few Persian arrowheads. Secondly, there is some purely linguistic evidence, and a variety of ancient authors, such as Plutarch or Cicero, who briefly mentioned the event. And th he actually wrote that uh, in Umbra enim prole blah 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 blah. We will actually fight in shade, like. If this source can be uh, listened to, then he actually said that. Thirdly, we will fight in the shade. Oh, fucking Alpha is dead, bro. Sources. One by the historian. You can't even talk to that one girl in your class. This guy's like, oh, I'm not gonna find the shade, you fucker. In Diodorus of Sicily, who wrote more than 300 years after the battle. And finally by Herodotus, who provides the most extensive account. Paul Cartledge, one of the leading modern historians on this battle, said, quote, We either write the history of Thermopylae with Herodotus or not at all, end quote. However, Herodotus' account must be read Battle with that changed the world. Some historians criticized him extensively because he included in his book such peculiar things as gold digging ants, or the description of ancient Egyptian ships, which were thought to be technologically impossible to build at the time. He's been described as a teller of fairy tales by some. Recently, however, he... If you... I, I don't... I'm not really into that, but if you study history, especially ancient history, you probably spent a lot of time with Herodotus. And I don't know much about him, but... It's very interesting to determine if Herodotus is a bit of a fairy tale teller or actually very historical man. Because with that, a lot of redeemed things by scholars stand and archaeological fall. findings alike, which proved some of his stories to be plausible. The gold digging ants have been reasonably identified with the large Himalayan marmot by Michel Beisel. And the underwater archaeologist Frank Godio found a wreck of the described type of ship in the depth of the River Nile. Holy crap, with that so in mind, let's reconstruct. With that in mind, he actually did not talk shit. Damn, Herodotus actually very truthful guy. They went about the Battle of Thermopylae. 
The approaching Persians set up their camp on the northern side of the pass, while the Greeks expected them on the southern end, standing in the narrowest part of the pass. According to Herodotus, Xerxes first sent his archers against the united Greeks. But they probably did very little, since the Greeks formed a phalanx, a very tight formation, and covered each other with their shields. Ima I know I'm always saying the same in these episodes, man, but one last time, imagine witnessing this in real life, man. How mind-blowing that must be, like, unimaginable. By the way, that this the really now famous happened, phrase, man. That, that, that always we blows my mind. I don't know if I sound like a weird guy here. the 300 movie as well was actually already mentioned frequently in antiquity by writers such as Cicero or Plutarch. Next up, the Persians are said to have sent 10,000 lightly armored foot soldiers. As Xerxes saw them failing, he sent in the so-called Immortals, a heavily armored veteran unit who counted 10,000 men. Okay, Although we must ridiculous. doubt these numbers <laughs> the given by that? Herodotus, oh, hey. we probably find what an authentic <laughs> element of ancient battle tactics <laughs> Don't make that a video game. Herodotus explains that the Greeks switched out soldiers who fought in groups according to their cities. This is to say that for a while the Spartans were fighting, then the Thespians, then the Thebans, and so on. Some historians argued that the phalanx usually had one weak point, namely that the formation tended to be weaker left on side. the left flank, since all the hoplites tried to bring their unshielded right flank close to the next man's shield. Consequently, the phalanx had the tendency to push to the right. Thus, two phalanges in a Greek on Greek battle tended to slowly spin in a circle because they were always moving forward on their stronger right. That's flank a great video, man. Ultra historical, interesting facts. Flank. Very good. In video. the narrow pass of Thermopylae, the Persians could not take advantage of that weakness. On the second day, Xerxes is said to have sent his men again, hoping that the Greeks were now burned out. But his forces were repelled again. Imagine how Xerxes must have, must have felt that, man. You have this mega army and you just get shit on. Century, the Battle of Thermopylae is portrayed as a fight of a handful of Greeks against <laughs> millions of Persians. Although many of these portrayals are massively overstated, it is probably true that there were only few defenders at Thermopylae who fought against a huge Persian army. But let's have a closer look at the numbers. Due to religious festivities, namely the Olympic Games in honor of Zeus Olympus, the Greeks were unable to deploy their full power in 480 BC. Additionally, Fucking the Spartans man. held a festival in the honors of Apollo and Carnus, during which they were traditionally not allowed to fight. Some also argued that the Spartans feared an internal uprising of a slave-like part of their population called Helots, so they didn't want to send too many Spartans away. However, because that much was at stake, the Greek city-states decided to send a small fort. And, uh, another weird thought. Yesterday I was laying in bed and I wondered how did an ancient Greek Spartan warrior look like, especially in terms of muscle mass? You know, these Greeks, they didn't have a gym, they didn't know what curls are and stuff. I wonder what kind of body type they had. I really... and, and, and I would feel that they, they, they didn't look like gym members. I think they would look like this. I, I would think they looked like this, you know? Because that's a body, you, you, you... that's like a fleshy, meaty body. I feel like they would look like this. But maybe that's already too much, man. Because what was what, what that diet, man? This guy obviously can have the right diet scientifically, man. That's probably too much, yeah. Men with wrestlers. Thermopylae and Artemisium, respectively. Which... They looked like farmers, not bodybuilders. And that, I don't really agree with that. If you if you listen to the sources, a Spartan was fighting his whole life. They did, they did uh, this old wrestling style. They were fighting all the time. They probably worked a lot, uh, having stones in their hands. They, they probably were not just skinny little bitch boy, non-sub farmers, you know? Closer to like Bruce, Bruce Lee. That probably, man. Such a, but you see how what an interesting question that is, right? Should delay the and Persians you never know the right the answer, but you're probably right. Would yeah. arrive after the religious festivals. A bit more skinny According and stuff. to Herodotus, the Spartan forces but not consisted a of, fat, of I would Hippeus, think. the traditional bodyguard of a Spartan king. These are the famous 300. They were accompanied by about a thousand perioikoi, lower class but free citizens. In addition, there were probably a thousand helots, unfree people. Paul Carter Gerald suggests that this be known only made approximately 16% of Sparta's full strength. Leonidas left Sparta with this small force, but he gathered many other Greeks along the way. Mantineans, Corinthians and Thebans, to name but a few. In total, Herodotus lists at least 4,700 Greeks okay, from other city-states. This makes a total of approximately 7,000 Greeks. And Herodotus While is such an important human being perfectly reasonable. <laughs> Herodotus estimates that there were two and a half million soldiers and the same number of support yeah, personnel on the Persian man, side. 
This is not only improbable, but impossible. Yeah. Two and a half million soldiers would have been 14 to 29% of all Persian men. As an agricultural society, the Persians could never have afforded to send so many men away. As a comparison, Germany deployed about 16% of its men in the Second World War at any given time. More recent estimates reach from 50,000 Persians to 250,000 50 250 is a very wide range though, man. Based Jeez. on the logistical capabilities of the Persians. Still, the Persians did outmatch the Greeks by quite a significant margin. However, despite their numbers, the Persians did not find any way to break through. But right at this moment, a Greek traitor by the name Ephialtes told the Persians about a small narrow mountain pass, which and that was what, How true is that? Folk. Maybe they just lost? Or did that really happen? But you hear that so often. Ephialtes also means traitor in Greek, he, which sounds a bit fantastic, right? associated among the Greeks as the stereotypical traitor. I know his name was Ephialtes and then that turned to the word traitor. Huh? The literal translation of Ephialtes is a nightmare which is very telling nightmare. by itself. Leonidas had to face a difficult decision. Should he retreat or hold his no, ground? Man, that At man, dawn of the, the third first day, Giga Alpha the Greeks chat were in history, almost dude. encircled. Leonidas summoned a council of... Because that's the point. Even whatever is true here, it looks like Leonidas did what he had to do and died uh, um, with his men and forced countrymen. And I remember reading, maybe he's going to talk about this for a second. Uh, Leonidas died actually very early in the battle and the Persians took his body. But after a while, the Greeks managed to get his body back, like his arm was cut off and all that shit. That's, I read that somewhere. I, I remember in the Louvre, I had this thing looking at the thing, and I had this thing looking at the thing. In the Louvre, you have, like, a guide, right? And they said War. something about that Some he died the early, and they fought with to get his body back. They left right before the Persians completed the encirclement. Leonidas must have been aware of the fact that this was his last chance to leave, and to save himself and his men. Nevertheless... He stayed at the pass, and according to Herodotus, about 2,000 soldiers stayed behind to fight and die oh. with him. Aye, aye, aye. Up to this day, it is a conundrum for historians why Leonidas didn't retreat. On many occasions, this event served as an exemplum of patriotism and fatherland-loving sacrifice. Oh, yeah, fucking does. So much so that even the even Nazi, Nazi Germany used, used that? it for their war propaganda. What? I never heard of them in my life. They used the 300 Spartans? Hermann Göring, for example, used the analogy to Leonidas' deeds to tell the soldiers fighting at the Battle of Stalingrad in 1942-1943, who were also encircled by the Red Army. Oh, I didn't know that. That's... Oh, God, no step back. The problem here is you're not protecting your homeland, man. You're actually invading someone that where Leonidas was literally protecting like his home. Did. Let us have a look at the most common scholarly... But Tommy, they... Don't... Don't fuck... Don't fuck in there, man. ...by Leonidas' state. The first and rarest view is that the Spartans consulted the Oracle of Delphi before the battle. It Dude, the Oracle is so interesting. There's this massive uh, episode from Joe Rogan where he has an old historian there. And it's so interesting that the Oracle of Delphi was probably just a, a group of, of people that gave away uh, uh, mushrooms. Fermented mushrooms that would lead to hallucinogenics. They would make a potion out of that. They'd give it to world leaders and themselves and people would fucking trip out. And back then they didn't know what physiopharmaca etc is they didn't understand this shit so they were like wow holy shit i just saw god that makes so much sense to me man it prophesied that the spartan king would have to die according to this view origin of most religions even yeah in this and chose only spartans with a son to accompany him historian paul cartlidge suggests that his belief in the oracle might indeed have been firm enough to make him stay the usual counter-argument to this view is that the prophecies were most likely only created after a certain event had already happened. Another explanation, which has been considered by scholars, is that the Spartan law forbade them to retreat. Yet this has been largely debunked, for example by Anushka Alberts. No such law is actually documented. Some try to link this to the epitaph of Simonides, in which it says, quote, Go tell the Spartans, passerby we lie here obedient to their words end quote the greek word rima that's uh, on the statue has in, in translated as law and i think even in Timocles, you can read in these addition, words it seems unlikely that such a law ever existed there are many examples such as the battles of plataea or sphacteria in which the spartans reportedly performed strategical retreats hence there are only few who hmm. still believe this to be the case the last few takes into consideration Leonidas' yeah, personal role in this event. 
On one hand, he was a king. But this of... is very weird to me now because I heard in the Louvre that he died very early in the battle. Of Sparta. So uh, However, how will he make this? This, function, this is so interesting how you and me we will never know what the truth kids. is, right? It's impossible. On the other hand, he was a leader of an advance force which had to hold the pass until the other Greek city-states sent their main army to Thermopylae. In this position, he had a certain responsibility to hold the alliance together, which would have probably not been the case if he had left, if he had fled. He would have had to explain his failure and the Greeks might have disbanded their union. F and one thing is crystal clear, man. His decision to stay made him a fucking legend and now in 2022 a fucking bald ginger is reacting to him and his legacy on a fucking Finally, street, man. Leonidas would have How much more alpha can you be that you remember for 2000 years? The ships for your wouldn't last have had the time man. to retreat Achieved and could have been encircled as well. In addition, the soldiers who had left dude. Thermopylae would have been easily run down by the Persian cavalry if nobody had blocked their way. Considering this, it made sense to hold the ground to make sure the other Greeks could retreat safely and fight again. Archaeologists found loads of Persian arrowheads on a hill near the narrowest part of the pass. Isn't that and so cool? There's like a guy and he's like, hey, let's go to the hill. And then all day long, and then they find an arrowhead. And then they catalogalize the arrowhead and find out where it's from. And then it's like, yeah, this is fucking Persian, which means there was Persians here 2000 years ago. Wow, that's so cool, bro. That's Post so cool that, that you can do probably that. probably made his last stance there. In this position, he would have probably blocked the Persian horses or at least made himself an obvious target so that the Persian cavalry couldn't go after the retreating Greeks. After the Persians had slayed the last defenders, their way was free. The Persians entered the Greek mainland and sacked various but cities But then this massive battle, Athens. which we'll talk about next time happened. Yeah, where they got shit it on, It was bro. only at the Battle of Plataea and Plataea. Battle of Salamis. That I have the Greek it right, this is episode four, finally guys. Finally, were able to avert the Persian invasion. And they just got smashed, bro. That was episode three of Tommy Reacts to the biggest battles of human history. Interesting what comes next. Salamis and Plataea. Oh, onion man!